introducing our speaker, Carol. Okay, thank you, Erin. Um, it's my treat to introduce Saxon Holt to you this evening. Um, I've known Saxon for several years. Um, we've spent uh, some time um, in gardens together. We actually went to Chile um, together a couple of years ago, which was an amazing botanical um, expedition. Um, he, has, he is a photojournalist who has been photographing plants and gardens for I don't know how many years. Maybe he'll tell you a little bit about his, his background. And amazingly, um, the book that he's going to be talking about this evening is the 30th book that he has been the sole photographer for, which I just think is an amazing accomplishment. Um, he's a really fantastic photographer, obviously, to have that many books under his belt. He's passionate about gardening that's appropriate for um, our summer dry climates, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that this evening and seeing some of his stunning photographs. He's a gardener himself, um, and he's a member of the board of the Pacific Horticulture Society. Um, he, his articles on gardens and plants uh, have appeared in many different publications. He has a, a terrific website, Photo Botanic, if you haven't visited it, I encourage you to do so, where you can see his handiwork, um, get copies, you can order copies of his many books through, I think, his website. He also has um, some wonderful uh, tutorials on his website about how to become a good garden photographer. And in fact, one of his um, publications actually won an award, a gold medal award from the Garden Writers Association uh, for its outstanding coverage of how to do just that. So it's really a pleasure to introduce Saxon to you this evening and I'll turn it over to him. Wow, thank you, Carol. That is wonderful. <laughs> I feel like you put me on the spot here for, for all of these uh, accolades and all the things that I seem to be doing here and there. Um, and yes, while I think I'll get into some more of my background. Um, let me share my screen so we can get started with this. Um, and I don't have to, you don't have to look at me. Um, I hope that starts with the, um, the slide of the presentation. So that's, that's great. Um, uh, I really am happy to be here. It's, it's uh, I uh, feel like I'm amongst peers and people who share as much passion as I do about plants. Um, and I, I, I'm happy that you mentioned my um, photobotanic site and I'll, I added this to show um, the site is, it does have quite a bit of, uh, uh, information about taking pictures. I have a whole blog there with, with various backgrounds and various projects I have worked on, but there's a whole section there on photo tips and, and how to take uh, pictures and the, and the books, the eBooks I did, you can order there. Um, so that is certainly part of my repertoire though. Um, really what I'm doing now is, is what I call, the, it's, it's the summer dry project. It's, it's yes, I'm a photographer and I, I wanna use my photography skills to help change the aesthetic of what we expect to see in a garden picture. Um, the new book, Gardening in Summer Dry Climates, is a direct descendant of the book we did about 20 years ago, 19, 20 years ago for the East Bay Municipal Utility District. I hope some of you know that, but it was specifically uh, created for the Bay Area uh, because the uh, Water District wanted to make sure its ratepayers knew they were getting you know, something targeted for them, but it was quite useful across much of California, um, and uh, it's now out of print. And so Nora Harlow, who was the, uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, in the Water Conservation Division for East Bay Mud and wrote the original book mostly herself, uh, she and I wanted to do the update. Um, and it, it became really part of what we are largely calling the Summer Drive Project. Um, the book is the obvious culmination of it right now, um, but we do have a, um, a website, the summerdry.com website, uh, an Instagram account, um, and we're working closely with the Wuckels database. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, Wuckels, it's a uh, state database where all plants that are sold in California are, are listed. Um, it's somewhat out of date. Um, some people say it's really out of date because it hasn't been updated in about nine years or so, but it's, it's still quite useful, um, but it was created 
to do water calculations for those uh, planners who needed to show how much water a uh, installation was going to, going to use. Uh, the database provides tools that every plant is rated uh, for every city in the state by low, very low, or various categories. So you can find out you know, how to make your calculations. But because the site has no photos or plant descriptions, it's so much useless for a lot of folks who are just casual gardeners um, and don't know what the plants look like. So part of the Summer Drive project is to update that database. And it's, we've been working on it for oh, three years now. It's, there's a lot of updates already happening and uh, we hope be more for the future. Um, but um, I wanna just really start though, when the whole gardening idea is um, whether it's Mediterranean or summer dry or whatever you wanna call it, it's your garden where you are um, and understand your own local climate, your own manifestation of the summer dry. Um, this is where I live. Um, this is Mount Burdell State Park in Novato. I'm in Marin County. Um, I can literally see this mountain from my house and I walk there several times a week. Um, this particular picture is rather sad because it's taken about the same, this time of year a number of years ago when the Buckeyes were in full bloom. And this particular one is, is a rosy colored one. It's quite a nice specimen on the mountain. Um, and it's, they're blooming now on the mountain and throughout California. Uh, but I went recently and they're blooming and going dormant at the same time. The, is, the ground is so dry. Um, the landscape is already shutting down and it's only, it's not even summer yet. So it's, uh, for those of you who don't pay real close attention, it's very, very severe. Um, and I hope we, we, we start, you know, there's really not, I don't want to get into a dystopia here about how bad it's going to be. Um, and hopefully part of my message is that gardeners can make a difference. Um, and so I think that's really part of, uh, of, of you know, the whole message for what for all of us want to do as gardeners. Um, this has become sort of our motto um, that in the midst of this tumultuous climate change, we realize it's all the more important that gardeners be stewards of the land, attuned to the local environment on behalf of all creatures. Every act we do adds resiliency. This has become somewhat of uh, the motto of the Summer Drive Project, but I am personally bringing that to Pacific Horticulture as part of our messaging. Um, that we're not just about um, any old plants. We need to have talk about resiliency and those plants that are really going to be helpful to the climate. Um, and so for the new book, um, I'd say the original book was only for the Bay Area. Um, we expanded this uh, as we expanded the concept of Summer Dry to the entire Pacific Coast um, and then divided that into four regions. Um, start here in Southern California. Um, this is uh, Torrey, Torrey, um, yeah, Torrey Pines State Park and the Coastal Chamise. Uh, so Coastal Chaparral is a, a classic landscape form uh, that, that Calorin has given us. Uh, we need to understand that and sort of work with it. Uh, the next zone, we went inland. Uh, Northern and Southern California are really heavily influenced by maritime and fog, but the inland areas are much hotter and much drier. And that's a whole separate classification of plants. Here we've used a photograph from uh, Carrizo Plains during one of the super bloom years. Uh, again, this is the, representing oak woodlands for, for the Northern California, uh, for the Northwest. We use this uh, park, a Camasia State Park outside of Portland, seen here in the spring when the you know, flowers are blooming and the native oaks uh, are populating the, the landscape. So from each of these four native landscapes, these four uh, different regional uh, summer dry climates, we extrapolated gardens to match. Um, for Southern California, uh, we have this, uh, an example, uh, uh, not really coastal chaparral, here we have a Carex lawn uh, replacing what, what some people might have a traditional lawn, uh, much less uh, water needs, uh, much more fire uh, adapted. Um, you can see in the distance, the, the marine influence of the oceans. Uh, for the inland valleys, uh, really I love this, uh, this dry stack wall, which, which leads the eye out into the mountains beyond. You really get a feeling of perhaps how hot it really is in the, in the inland valleys. For the Northwest, um, this, this is a picture from um, Bellevue Botanic Garden, which is a uh, garden outside of Seattle. This is their water, dem water efficiency demonstration garden. Um, gets very little water. It's lusher than most of us would can imagine for California, but 
we do see a lot of very similar plants with grasses and alliums, uh, salvias, berberis, things that really are tough and adapted. And we need to learn how to choose just the right cultivars for our own, own ad adaptations. This is the photograph we chose for Northern California region, the fourth of the four regions. Um, this is the one actually I wanted to have on the cover of the book because it showed a larger mature landscape. The, the book is, you know, it's a lovely colorful cover and I think that's what marking was keen on. But I, I like this because I like seeing those um, Arbutus, um, Arbutus marina, which are older. They've been in this garden for a number of years. Uh, the formiums have reached their climax stage and they use very little water. And then they're, what used to be a lawn in this garden is now the, the, the ornamental grasses. So it's, it's important to understand you know, how we adapt to the climate for each of our, for each of our zones. Um, but let's consider the larger uh, zones of the world, really. I'm, I'm gonna show several different maps uh, sequences to so try to explain the summer dry climate and how that relates to, to Mediterranean. Um, this is the, the, the Köppen maps, which is um, developed by a German botanist and a climatologist called Vladimir Köppen um, about you know, more than hundred years ago. Um, he was trying to devise formulas that would define climatic boundaries in such a way that corresponded to the vegetation zones or biomes that were being mapped during his lifetime. Um, they came up with 28 different classifications. You can see them along the bottom. Um, the ones that are most uh, adapted to us are what are classically considered Mediterranean, CSA, CSB, and CSC. C simply being mild temperate zones, S for dry summers. And then that third letter, uh, A for hot summers, B for warm summers, and C for cool summers. Um, I'm gonna show some more maps detailing later um, how the dry summer mild temperate zones break down even further into 28 regional summer dry climates. I'm gonna expand on what's been traditionally termed a Mediterranean climate. But you can begin to see here how the whole planet is divided into vegetation zones and can see that there are five very similar vegetation types to our own. Um, we're gonna call that the summer dry ecotopes. Um, I think gardeners should really think of their own local climates in terms of vegetation zones and understand them as the smallest ecologically distinct landscape feature in a mapping and classification system. Vegetation zones, of course, means plants. And gardens that share common ecotopes can often share selected plants that are adapted, climate tolerant, and sustainable. These were the criteria for selecting plants in the new book, and which are the core is an exploration of which plants from the five regional summer dry ecotopes are adapted to each other. We certainly need to have a discussion about habitat and native plants and how plants from other regions might or might not be invasive and the ecosystem services. But that's the art of gardening really and why gardeners need resources to help find those adapted plants. No surprise, gardeners tend to love plants and with the Summer Drive project, we want to make sure you pick the best ones that are climate adapted. But let's move from this ecologically distinct landscape, the ecotope, into ecotones um, and drill down as, into our regional microclimates and consider air gardens as ecotones and start visualizing that how all gardeners can all help with that goal of resiliency, as I think we, we really must. What's an ecotone? Well, it's a border zone where ecological systems meet and mingle, sometimes forming new communities. Well, I think that's one way we could, could describe a garden. Um, air sensibilities, can and must model ecosystems on those small parts of the earth that are under our own care. Sure, we can have fun with plants and from similar ecotopes, but when we mingle in these new communities we are calling gardens, those plants must be climate adapted. There's too much at stake now with dramatic climate change to do otherwise. Gardeners must be stewards of the land. As stated in our mission statement, attuned to the local environment on behalf of all creatures, every act we do adds resiliency. I would argue that your garden is not your own. It's your interface with the earth. We are all stewards for garden earth. As gardeners, we have a distinct responsibility these days to think globally and act locally. We have that responsibility to society to model a behavior that is socially responsible. Gardening is valuable. And that's the thrill. Just knowing every small act we do makes a difference. Gardens matter. And as Doug Tallamy said in his new book, Nature's Best Hope, gardens 
are what matter. Gardens are nature's best hope. I'm really loving this term, ecotone, as applied to gardens. It's a natural progression of understanding climate tolerant gardening from the biomes of the Copen vegetation maps to ecotopes to ecotones and our own little microclimates, which is how we must all use the concept of naturalistic gardening to include biodiversity, watershed, wrapped around green infrastructure, wildlife corridors, urban oases, where ecological systems meet and mingle, sometimes forming new communities. Well, those are our gardens. Our gardens are ecotones and we are part of the whole. We don't really expect our gardens to be climate classifications though. We want them to have their own special plants beyond whatever endemic natives that might be locally adapted. We certainly want them to celebrate the climate and fit comfortably in the local microclimates and connect wild nature to our built landscapes. There's no getting around that most of us live in metropolitan areas that almost always need supplemental water. So we must plan for green infrastructure that connects gardens to the ecosystems, those ecotones. Before we go on to discuss some more specific plants and garden examples and how we integrate gardens into the green infrastructure, I wanna show another series of maps, more specifically about the regional differences within our summer dry climate across the Pacific coast, our part of the world, which when we consider it as a whole is much broader than typically Mediterranean. I have a series of maps here that I found uh, through Pacific Bulb Society. They have a really wonderful website with lots of information about bulbs and lots of descriptions about various uh, summer dry climates around the world. Um, we see an expansion of the typical Mediterranean summer dry that includes here, as you can see, most of the Pacific Northwest and the Middle East, including the steppes in Western Asia with 28 measurable classifications far broader than what is typically understood to be Mediterranean. You note in these uh, 28 classifications are divided through rainfall and cold temperatures. Um, I, it was hard for me to come up with um, when I, my research finding something specific to define Mediter Mediterranean um, with various waterfall and temperatures. And it's one of the reasons I really latched on to the whole summer dry concept because it's, um, there's so many subcategories of it. Um, we can see here, uh, I'll break down a little bit of examples for, uh, for Southern California. We see some of those 28 zones represented here um, and specifically um, Los Angeles and Riverside, which are you know, literally next door to each, each other, but on the uh, climate zones, they're not even contiguous. Um, uh, LA is cooler um, and of course, uh, uh, Riverside is, is drier um, and that it's so much difference that on these uh, 28 categories, they're not even side by side. It's, it's really um, something we, we all intuitively understand. I'm in the Bay Area and you in Southern California understand that how quickly you leave the maritime coast the, and influence of the hills, things change quickly. Um, and we need to understand those uh, various summer dry climates in order to get our own uh, ad adaptations. Um, Carol asked about how long I've been taking pictures and I, I say it's about 35 years. And over that time, um, I, I first began hearing people talk about Mediterranean gardening and Mediterranean plants. But after an initial flush of wisdom and understanding, the more I traveled from Albuquerque and Denver, uh, Seattle, San Diego, the less I understood about what everyone meant when they said they had a Mediterranean garden. Among gardeners, the term Mediterranean has become fairly well understood as one adapts to a climate that's wet in the winter with a relatively few extended periods of frost. And summers, predictably hot and dry, fostering gardens designed around outdoor living, using plants living happily with the heat and dry weather of a given microclimate. However, I've noticed in my years of photographing the gardens in California that many in the public understand the concept of Mediterranean lifestyle without really understanding the climate, the vegetation, and the many different types of plants that are adapted to it. For many non-gardeners, the Mediterranean lifestyle is simply outdoor living. It's a hot, dry summer day under a ramada with a, a charcuterie of Spanish sausages, some French cheeses, Italian bread and Greek olives, and of course the emblematic California wine. Now that's the California and, and Mediterranean lifestyle. However, as a journalist and a gardener, still learning to appreciate a summer dry climate after growing up in Virginia, which is a hot, humid mid-Atlantic place where lawns are mowed just to beat back nature. 
Um, I felt it was my job to find and show a new aesthetic. Um, gardeners are different here. They must be different here. Um, and it became my job to illustrate them. For many years, even up to the beginning of this century, most garden publishers treated all the West Coast as simply a temperate region, seldom addressing the climate, and more often than not, marveling that gardeners could overcome dry summers with water sucking plants popular in England and the East Coast. But slowly, as outdoor living and the California and Mediterranean lifestyle began to creep into popular culture, Mediterranean style gardens began to appear in books and magazines, often associated with wineries and olive trees. Gardeners began to realize it's much easier to work with plants adapted to the climate, and indeed how wonderful they looked as an authentic connection to the outdoors and the native aesthetic. And now I think we are thinking of gardens as ecotones. And really it's my job explicitly as a photojournalist to help gardeners see that new aesthetic and create, help create those ecotone gardens. One more thing about the, the summer dry garden is distinctly meant to refer to a climate and not a garden that gets no water in the summer. Um, I can give an entire separate lecture about water for gardens and the need we have as a culture to honor water and put it to its highest use. For many, many reasons, we need to have supplemental water in summer for municipal and urban ecotones, not the least of which is hydration for fire issues. The battle for water rights is legendary and ongoing and is only gonna get worse, um, but the amount of water a garden deserves is most certainly debatable, but we should not debate it requires some water. And for the sake of the plants amidst the pavement, as well as of course, the lifestyle of the people. So the Summer Drive Project wants to encourage an ecological approach, specifically describing and illustrating climate tolerant plants in garden settings, where we can celebrate and honor the summer dry climate and redefine beauty holistically. And I will note, I'm, I will um, emphasize, I call it climate tolerant plants and not drought tolerant plants. I think the climate's changing, the definition of drought's even changing. We have to have things that are climate tolerant. Um, so that really is the uh, of sum up the, summing up the first part of the presentation, um, which is really more about the science and things that Nora would have talked about when she was uh, uh, as, as co-author. Um, I, I go here to um, what I call my patio slide. If there are any questions that anyone has had from the from the beginning and the and the sort of the, the science background, um, this is a great time to take questions. We will take questions later, but um, from here. I'm gonna go more into specific gardens and specific plants and talk about the, the gardens themselves. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I love having questions. So if there are any now, we'll, you know, does any come in? Is, um, Aaron, have you seen anything? Not yet, but I do have a question. Sure. Do you, do you see that uh, people living in similar summer dry climates, do they have the same kind of interest that we do here in California? Like, are they also experiencing oh, drought yeah. some, as we are? As, yes, uh, it's, it's, I've traveled up and down, the, I've, I've traveled a lot over the years for various projects, um, uh, but I travel again for this book. And uh, one of the fun things, when I went to Portland and talked to some of the uh, best plant people in, in the area, uh, I always try to find out who knows what's what. and. Uh, a lot of folks were very excited to show me around um, gardens that were adapted because Portland is getting hotter. The year I was there, I think they had a, some 100 degree time, some 100 degree temperatures. Uh, and what was really sort of funny is many of the folks were so eager to show me California plants. And I just sort of had to laugh and say, well, I didn't come to Oregon to see California native plants. But uh, the point being that uh, they're in the Northwest and California hotter and drier summers that's creeping that direction. And so our native plants are being more well understood in the nurseries. I think, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, when I first started in the business, there was very little appreciation of the summer dry climate. And most nurseries carried plants that were common in the garden magazines at the time, you know, the, the English and East Coast style. And um, all you had to do was add a little water and you could do anything. But now we, we don't have a little water to spare. So it, it's, a, it's much more awareness uh, up and down um, the whole the whole Pacific Coast. So yes, um, is, is uh, we don't really know which way the climate is going to go or how quickly, but um, but I think there's a, a certainly an acknowledgement of that uh, up and down the Pacific Coast. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to talk. Um, do other, other questions come in, Aaron? No, not yet. Okay. I I hope um, you know I'm happy to ask answer questions later, and also if if people like Steve or Carol want to jump in later for questions, it can be a much more lively uh, presentation. Um, I actually wanted to mention uh, in your plant sharing. <laughs> There was someone who who was interested in uh, pencil type plants, and one of the plants that I um, have come across uh, working on the Vucles project is a California native, Asclepius um, subulata, which is looks like a pencil. It looks like a uh, uh, it's a desert uh, milkweed, and it, for that person who's, who wants those pencil like uh, plants, that is a, is a classic. Um, Carol may know it, um, but it's a it. it, it the point being, yes, we, I do. Yeah, when we get in conversations later, uh, I hope we can, you know, engage the audience. But I think we need to move on, so we at least honor. We can try to end up on time. So let's let's move forward. Jackson, I'll take the name of that plant and I'll send it to Sandy later. Okay. Yeah, Asclepius sub. I know she'll appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I think um, from from this point on, we're going to talk about various categories of plants and some of the design solutions they, they offer. Um, we start, saw in the first section, these four gardens adapted to the four different regions. Um, and gardeners can really be a com um, significant component of restoring the balance to our rapidly changing climate that is in desperate need of some resiliency. Restoring that balance can begin through communities working together and linking together in a green infrastructure. Every garden counts in all styles. When communities think collectively and gardens of all kinds knit together on behalf of larger ecosystems and watersheds, then each of our gardens becomes part of a green infrastructure. Groundwater restoration, nature oases, carbon sinks, heat sinks, and wildlife corridors. There are a lot of clearly defined scientifically based solutions where gardeners can contribute solutions by creating their own ecotones that become those regenerative gardens. Every act we do Edge resiliency. Recently, um, uh, uh, before I go on, uh, these are the uh, four, four categories representing plants, fire safety, carbon sequestration, and water use that we're going to get to. Um, but I want to mention uh, the work of Obi Kaufman, which I hope some of you know. He's produced some fantastic uh, field guides in recent years. Um, and I, I think he's you know, has the stature of John Muir. I really, he's an artist, an illustrator, a deep thinker, um, and has some great things to say. And particularly, I quoted this, my work operates in what can be called a post-environmentalist world, where the arguments of pure logic are over, and we've moved on from merely toiling to prevent degradation to now greater visions wrapped up in better stories of how we mitigate catastrophe. Two opposing truths are relevant. One, the amount of biodiversity still extant is a miracle. And two, we are already in the bottleneck of cascading effects toward a permanently altered biosphere. In my own daily practice of making sprawling books of California nature and what we can all do in our own work of creating gardens, aim to balance the discourse of this big picture stuff, all the while concentrating on the smallest geographically specific niche truths upon which the living world relies. That is just a wonderful summation, those geographically specific niche truths upon which the living world depends upon. That's, those are gardens. Each of our gardens can be a niche truth. So all of you here today, a gardener or not, um, can advocate for gardens. Gardens do matter. In the built landscape of cities and suburbs, gardens make our lives habitable. They need to make an ecosystems habitable for all creatures from birds and bees to mushrooms and mycorrhiza. These four photos will introduce some of the things I want to cover today. The, the book is not really a uh, design book. It's really a, a plant book. It's you know, two thirds, three quarters of it is it's just a plant encyclopedia. Um, but we do talk about some basic design ideas and I, I'd love to engage in conversation later. Uh, these, uh, the upper left really is a, there's a whole section about plants, but then we also talk about firescaping, uh, carbon sequestration, um, and water usage, uh, which to me is one of the most fundamental things. And clearly um, in the current drought situation, people are recognizing more and more that it's, a, it's an urgent need to adapt our infrastructure 
um, to help the planet. Um, we, we simply must do that. And I think it's great to hear this whole concept of infrastructure being expanded uh, to include green infrastructure. Um, here is a bioswale uh, next to UC Davis. Um, I included the um, car in the photograph to make sure folks knew that this was in a parking lot um, and the, it's designed to capture runoff, help filter it, allow it to percolate and also clean it before it goes down in, into Puda Creek. Um, and this is the kind of uh, infrastructure improvements that if done on a wider scale will allow water to percolate back into the groundwater. One of our biggest problems right now with the current drought is we, yes, we've had historic droughts this bad, but we haven't had them when the groundwater is so depleted, when the humans have sucked out the water with wells. So the groundwater that does happen doesn't get deep anymore. Um, and, you know, valley oak trees are now dying in the Central Valley because um, the historic nature of this drought. We need to figure ways to get water back into the groundwater. Um, I was just on a webinar day before yesterday with some water um, managers in Sonoma and Marin County and they talk about how their the future is water banking um, or underground storage. Um, and one of the ways that happens is with things like bioswales. Um, I want to, uh, while I'm talking about water, I want to touch on several other ideas that are really important for, for capturing water. Gardeners must understand that we can't depend upon municipal water, treated water, uh, if we're going to have any sort of complex gardens whatsoever. Um, this is a, a garden, um, Judy Adler. She's an environmentalist and activist in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, she's pioneered actually some, some state uh, laws on what rainwater capture and storage. In her backyard, she has three large cisterns um, hidden somewhat by the uh, uh, lattice work and, and, and the fence between her house and a neighbor's house. Um, but these cisterns are filled up by rainwater from the roof and the roof being higher than the cisterns, there's a simple gravity system underneath that uh, deck there that, that fills up these cisterns. Um, it's also important, I think, for us to understand that to capture this water in the winter when it rains, uh, it's, it's important to use the water when the plants need it. I used to completely poo-poo the whole idea of, of rain barrels and small cisterns and thinking, well, why in the world do you want to capture 55 gallons or you know, 1,000 gallons of water um, in the winter when that's a, such a drop in the bucket uh, in the summer when the, by the time you needed it, there would be mosquitoes in it and the water would be putrid. And you know, that was silly to store small amounts of water. Well, no, uh, the concept has evolved that we should store the water in the winter and use it in the winter. Um, the climate uh, is changing in regards that we are expecting bigger storms on less frequent basis. Um, and if that's true, we may have a big storm um, and go weeks before the next storm. Um, instead of that uh, big storm running down the gutters and causing floods, if we store it um, temporarily, and if it doesn't rain in uh, three or four days or a week, use the water when the plants need it. Our, our summer dry climates want it to be water, winter wet. You, you can't overwater in the winter. Um, and that's when they need it. That's when the best time for it to percolate down in the groundwater um, below the root zones, if, if at all possible. So I, I've been advocating that you collect water in the winter and use it in the winter. Um, if it's, you know, obviously if it stops raining, um, but that's, that's a, a great idea and help your plants go through the dry summers if they have a reasonably good wet winter. Um, this is a, a really nice example of a percolation. This is a garden in Woodland Hills. Uh, I've included in the picture uh, the gutter of the roof of the house um, and the water per goes from the roof down the gutter into this rain garden and uh, goes through the front yard. The designers included some you know, nice colored rock and things uh, to help it look nice. Um, but the concept is having the water flow and percolate into the ground before it went out into the streets and rushed in the storm, in the, you know, in the storm drains. Um, the, 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 our adapted plants are deeply rooted. So let's get that water in the ground while we have it. Um, I think it's very simple to have, retrofit our gardens to think about these adaptations. Um, and some of the new municipal codes with M. Wello, uh, new developments and uh, uh, perhaps private homes will be required to capture water and keep it on site. Um, I included this slide to talk about uh, irrigation in general. Um, plants, uh, even our, our most adapted plants, need some water when they first go in and probably 
through the first summer. Um, so we need to have irrigation to allow for that. This is a, a very classic irrigation simple system. Um, there are emitters at each plant. Um, so when it goes in that they can get some water throughout the summer. Um, most likely you would want to expand your drip emitters after the first year as the root zones go out. Um, and then as the plants get bigger and they cover the ground, you can probably cut back the water quite a bit. Um, again, depending on how, how dry the winters might be, but, but it's important to understand um, even our best adapted plants need some water when they first go in. Um, I've done a, a, a number of work uh, with uh, Urban Water Group. I don't know if Marilee Coleman is a member of the group or, or is, might be here, but um, I admire uh, the work of the Urban Water Group of figuring out how to capture water for their clients and, and put it in the ground. This particular garden in um, Santa Monica has in the front yard there is a, is a, is a bioswale. The water is collected you know, into that. But what's, a, what's wonderful is the next door neighbors um, saw that and they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to capture water and help the street trees you know, have retained water. Uh, and literally a light bulb went off in my head when I went um, and saw this second time I worked for them and saw these two gardens side by side. And I realized this is exactly what green infrastructure is talking about. If we can change, uh, whether it's mandated through zoning but, or, or tax incentives, but if we can encourage people to put this sort of uh, front yard gardening where we capture the water uh, neighbor to neighbor to neighbor, street by street, uh, we can make our cities much more livable. We can make the trees much more adapted. Um, and it's, it's, it's very sensible. It's, it's something that we can all do. Um, those of us that have, you know, properties and front yards, but it's, it's real, it's, you know, why not? Why not do that? Um, some of the other uh, categories we, we talked about for these, our, our niche trues, these gardens. Um, uh, we, uh, before I go on, actually, I want to talk about water one more time because it's, uh, we are so dry, those of us who garden who don't have a bird bath or a small fountain of some kind should go out tomorrow and do it. Um, it is so dry, the critters are, are thirsty too. Um, so let's have you know, even a simple bird bath um, to get some more water in the gardens and try to design some water features, uh, not just for our own benefits of the sound of water and the you know, uh, humidity, and the, but for the, the creatures who, who, who do fly through and, and need the water themselves. Um, fire escaping is, is obviously on everyone's mind. I live right in, in a um, oak woodland in an urban interface here. I, you know, I, I, I chose to live here in the, in the woods, but um, I'm certainly concerned about the fires and what we can do uh, with design standards now of putting hardscape between the house and the, and the landscape, uh, using low plants uh, here, a bunch of succulents, uh, including whatever trees we do have, make sure they're well pruned and don't overhang the house. Um, for those who really want to have the lawn look, a Carex lawn, a sedge lawn is a, is a great substitute, uh, much less water than a traditional lawn. Um, and it also provides that hydration and, and fire break that uh, a meadow, a hydrated meadow can offer. We included this slide in the book for a small subsection about uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, it's a really, a, a, a uh, complex issue, um, the, you know, whole books are written about it, but at the core, the, we all as plant people understand that, that plants collect CO2 and they make, uh, they, they collect it from the air and they make their own carbon and they do sequester it in the ground. The roots put it into the ground, not just in their own mass, but in the ground with the complex nature of uh, mycorrhiza and the rhizosphere by covering the ground with as many plants as we can, we ensure that as much carbon is getting put back in the ground as, as possible. Um, I use this wonderful shot, a really tiny, small garden in Oakland. It's a front yard garden, which uses native uh, California uh, coffee berry as a front yard ornamental shrub. Uh, it clearly can take pruning. Um, being limbed up here so they can have a little light underneath it for some wildflowers uh, shows how understanding how plants can be used um, can really in, or, you know, enliven your own garden. And that's really the, the crux of the whole book is how to use plants. Um, 
Uh, some of you may know this garden, um, Jim Bishop in San Diego, um, uh, a master of plant selection on a really, really steep hillside um, and understanding how plants work together and the cultivars and the shapes and the, and the colors is really, uh, it's really fun for me to, to learn about these things and then try to show others how you know, choosing the right plants really can make a big difference. Um, I love this, this, uh, this is a garden in Long Beach. Um, this is a California native uh, quail bush, uh, Atroplex lentiformis. Um, it's really a silver foliage. When I traditionally have seen this, it's been a fairly leggy, uh, unkempt uh, wild plant, but it can be pruned. Um, and here it looks great. Look against the blue of the Ceanothus with a few spring daffodils. It really sets apart the other shrubs in the border. Um, again, understanding what this shrub will do, how big it will get, um, is really in, informs what we try to do with the book. Um, interestingly, when I did a presentation for the East Bay Mud uh, group, their, their um, media person was really uh, uh, sensitive to the presentation and went over it with a fine tooth comb before I even was allowed to present and called this photo out and said, I'm sorry, we can't allow you to shoot to show this because uh, it's an invasive plant. Uh, Echium, Prada Madeira. Uh, and I had to say, well, that's exactly why it's in the presentation because we do need to understand that some plants, they may be beautiful at one regard, but if they're invasive and they take over the ecosystems, they're invasive and they're not, they're not to be used. Um, so we need to be really careful when we, um, when we buy plants that we, let's see, this is a classic example. When people see it, they want it, um, but it's not for almost anywhere in the coastal regions. It really, it really spreads like crazy. Um, Understanding that that you know grasses and lawns can be can be changed. This is the garden of uh, David Frost, who owns Native Sons Nursery. Um, he's uh, spent a lifetime collecting various grasses and sedges, and this is his own garden. Um, he couldn't even tell me which plants were which because it's over the years they've so blended and and crossed over. But it's the uh, the point I try to make with this slide is that's what happens over time. I love seeing a garden that has been sustained. Uh, I won't say by neglect by any means, but you just let it happen um, and not overwatering and let, let the plants take their own naturalistic look and, and, and fitting in wonderfully with the ecosystems. Um, understanding succulents, uh, they're increasingly popular in many gardens. Obviously they're, they're quite adapted to the, cl to the climates. They, they can do get by with very little water, um, but what can happen to those who don't understand, succulents get big. Um, you can find a wonderful little four inch pot in a nursery with, and think, oh, isn't it cute? And it's gonna look great in my garden. And then three years later, you know, it's, 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 half, it's the size of a Volkswagen. Um, so understanding succulents and how they work together. Um, in the middle of this photograph is a, is a leucodendron, um, which is a pretty big shrub on its own uh, with these aloes uh, and agaves all around it. Um, one gets a sense that we need to understand the scale and, and choose plants wisely. Um, I chose this particular slide. Um, it's a sea and it's called Valley Violet. Um, one thing that we really need to understand about California natives, that they're all not created equal. Uh, of course, you know, everyone understands that a California redwood is native, but it's not adapted to any old part of the state. But the same could be said about a Joshua tree. It's, it's, it's adapted to uh, the Mojave, but it's not gonna survive in Death Valley. I mean, it's not, you have to understand where the plant comes from. So this uh, Ceanothus and Arctostaphylus, two of our best shrubs, uh, backbones of many native gardens, the cultivars come from different parts of the state. And so it's, it's important to understand where you live and which cultivars work for you. Um, and not just go to a big box store and say, I just want a Ceanothus or I want a Manzanita. Uh, go to the local native plant society or down there, of course, you have um, Theater of Pain or the, the independent nurseries. They understand uh, the local habitats and the, what plants are locally adapted. Um, say so this Valley Violet grows in the, in the valley in, in Davis. It's a really great, uh, great plant for the Central Valley. Um, for those of us who love native plants and but we don't want to have, uh, the, we don't have a lot of space, uh, the Fremontodendrons. Um, Get really big. I was, I was interested to hear Steve talk earlier about the monkey hand tree. Uh, one of the reasons you don't see it too often in gardens, it's huge. It gets really huge. Um, and so that's uh, 
out of scale for most people. And Fremontodendrons, the flannel bush, gets really big in gardens as well. But if you really want the plant and you love the California native and the color of the flowers, get a low growing one. Here's one uh, called Ken Taylor growing across a boulder in a fairly small garden, um, and enlivening the, the, the habitat, but it's not a huge plant. Again, understanding what plant works where is the key of, of why we do books and why we have websites to find things with succulents. Um, this is one, a yucca called um, Bright Lights, I think, um, variegated. Uh, if you're gonna have one, if you have space and want one in the garden, why not get one that's variegated? That, that can lighten things up. You know, know your plants and know your climate and know what's gonna fit in. Um, Manzanita is some of my favorites. Uh, I have a bunch in my own garden and I know over 20 years uh, that I've been gardening, they start to look like this. They, they, they can't support uh, leaves throughout their whole structure. They, as they grow up, the leaves grow up and expose this fabulous uh, bark and the architectural value of it is just, it's just wonderful. Here, here I'm standing uh, up against the back door of this house, looking out to their pool. Um, I don't know this garden from years ago, so I don't know when, this, you know when it was first planted, perhaps it was meant to be a shrub break so you couldn't see the pool. But now obviously it's, uh, they're taking advantage of the natural shape and, and using the plant to its greatest effect. I wanna encourage um, everyone to, to go to botanic gardens and the larger gardens to, to find examples of, of plants that are adapted to your own climates. Um, the, the, the better botanic gardens are, are do a great job of having plants that have been sustained, that are big enough so you know what you're looking at. Uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, the Los Angeles Natural History Museum where uh, Carol was instrumental and cre helped cre create this garden. Um, great examples of how plants work well together. They have a wonderful uh, native meadow area there too, but I, I particularly like this picture when these Parkinsonias in the spring when they're flowering yellow, goes so great with the blue of the agaves. Um, but a great resource to go and see what plants work um, in, in their own climate. Um, up here, uh, I like to tease my my San Francisco friends that they are not really in a summer dry climate, they're in a subtropical cloud forest. Um, because of the amount of uh, fog, uh, there's measurable rainwater all summer long from the, from the fog in, in inches, in a number of inches. Um, so the garden is adapted to that. Um, and the, even though it's, it, you know, it's, it is summer dry, it's not hot. So it's, it's a different example, but those folks who do live on the coast need to understand that you can do different things when you have the, the fog to work with. Um, one of my favorite gardens has always been the Ruth Bancroft Garden in Walnut Creek, which is in, in the uh, inland from me. It's in a fairly hot uh, part of Northern California. Um, and what's particularly great about it is it's a very mature garden. Ruth Bancroft, when she started it 50 some years ago, um, started putting together succulents and adapted plants so that now they're full scale and you, the garden is really well maintained now. It's a garden conservancy property. Um, it actually does not, it's certainly known for its succulents, but they have native plant section. Ruth collected iris. There, there are different shrubs in the, in the border, in the garden. that are not just succulents, but, um, but to have an example of how big they get and what looks good with what, what can be a, a ground cover, um, you know, what's, what's a tree. It, it's really fun to go to a mature garden um, and, and see it. Um, same with this, this garden at UC Davis. Um, Davis, the whole arboretum at Davis runs through the campus. Um, and this particular section is the Ruth Storer Garden. It's near the teaching arboretum. It's, uh, I've been photographing this for at least 20 years and they rotate different plants out and try them here. Some roses are being tried out to how tolerant they might be. They get, I think water once every, or twice a month. Um, but it's important for me to find these kind of gardens because I think it's important for gardeners to understand how big plants get, uh, how well they do or don't look with other plants uh, when they get maturity. Uh, I like to think of a new garden as a theory. Um, it may look good for, and it may have a great plan, but it's a theory until it's been sustained. Um, whether you sustain it yourself or have an army of gardeners, it's still, it takes, uh, I, I, I actually have a, you know, I say seven years at least, but I prefer 15 or 20 years to really see what a garden looks like. And then those pictures that I can show in the publications give people an idea of what a mature and sustained garden can look like. Um, 
I discovered the Fullerton Arboretum a few years ago. And I was just sort of amazed that I'd never made a point to get there before. Of course, you guys have the all of Austin's Arboretum and the California Botanic Garden, Descanso, uh, uh, many places to, to look at, to go and see examples of plants that are adapted to the climate. And I really recommend Fullerton. It's really a great place. Um, and then almost without uh, comparison, the Huntington Library gardens are just fantastic. I use them a lot as a resource for the Wuckels project because they have an extensive uh, library and good curation so I can find um, some plants there. But recently I say, I don't know, 10 years, someone there may know better than I, but they redesigned some of the entry gardens around the library and the, and the visitor area um, with a series of small space gardens. They're almost like garden rooms um, with, with cultivated, with cultivars not just species, but various cultivars that are new in the trade. And then those series of gardens culminate here at the end, where I think it's called the celebration garden, just before you enter into the lower, the vaster areas of the garden. Um, this particular area does change. The, the, the water feature is the same, but the, 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 compan the double beds are, are changing out. Um, I was just there a month or so ago, and it's, it's much different than when I photographed this with those, um, those purple, Euphorbias and the, uh, uh, I think that's a, a Dazzlerians. Um, they're, they're not there now, but the point is it's a great example of using a gardens that are adapted to the summer dry climates. Um, so I just want to then come back to the whole concept of, of what we as gardeners need to be thinking about. Um, as we as said in their, their motto, uh, to, to do, gardens on behalf of all creatures, not just on behalf of ourselves. Um, it's our contribution and commitment to a deep adaptation in, in green infrastructure that we must do in these changing times. There's so much that needs to be done. One is easily overwhelmed, especially with all the distractions we find in the media, which seem to compound every problem. A resilient future is only going to happen by lots of people doing lots of little things. Most importantly, we do need to change how we interact with the world. And a connected system of ecological ecotone gardens is one link in that system. Only one, but one we gardeners have some influence upon. Helping homeowners and gardeners, nature lovers and climate activists to understand that gardens are part of the solution will empower our work and give us hope. With that aim to, dis uh, the to balance the discourse of big picture stuff, all the while concentrating on the smallest geographically niche truths upon which the living world relies, those gardens that we have control over. For us, a summer dry climates, it's a living world that relies upon us to create gardens that honor the earth. We can do it together. Um, I wanna circle back to uh, some of the uh, resources that we offer with the Summer Dry Project. Uh, of course, I hope you can wanna buy the book. Um, if you go to the Summer Dry website, you can click on a button and get autograph copies. Of course, you can go to your local independent bookstore or, or any of the online sources, but we do have autograph copies uh, through the website. Um, and the, the Wuckels, there's a link to the Wuckels database there. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter uh, offering tips and profiles of various plants. So I'd, I'd urge you to sign up for the Summer Dry newsletter. And I said in the very beginning, you, Aaron was gracious to, and Carol to talk about my, some, my photobotanic website and my garden photography website, but um, I spend much more energy these days uh, working on the Summer Dry Project and I, I hope you will you know, follow along. One of the um, fun things about the uh, Summer Dry Project is the Instagram account for those of you who, who do that. Uh, I have a personal Instagram account, but this is the summerdry.gardens account and you'll see my logo is the hybrid monkey hand tree. Um, it's, a, it's just a fascinating, uh, biological achievement. But, um, but what's fun about the, the Instagram account, for those of you who do like Instagram, it's so immediate and in the moment. It's really fun to, when you see a, a, a photo you like and see who else might like it and see where they are and what their interests are. And what's really uh, fun for me, I get lost in it sometimes. I'll see a geotag because uh, if uh, in the Mediterranean um, or Chile or uh, Australia, people around the world who are sort of following this. But what's really interesting when you do the geotag and you go to someplace, uh, just this last week, I went to um, Aix-en-Provence. Um, and when you do the geotag, you don't really see gardens there. You, you see the beautiful people on the beaches. You see wineries, tourists. You don't really see gardens 
um, when you follow this the Mediterranean hashtag, often it's not Mediterranean gardens. It's just a Mediterranean lifestyle. Um, so anyway, that, that's, it's, it's, it's a fun follow. Um, I hope you can you know, we'll follow along. I'm gonna go back now to the, what I call the patio. Uh, hopefully there'll be some questions that came in. Aaron, I don't know if you had any or, or Steve or Carol, anyone who has questions, I'm, we can have a little bit of a dialogue. Um, yeah, we do I, I have, have one question. question and go for it, Carol. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Saxon, you've, you know, you've visited so many gardens and talked with uh, so many people, you know, the garden makers, the landscape professionals, the homeowners, the staff who work at public gardens. Um, what do you think is the biggest obstacle? This is not a fair question. What do you think is the biggest obstacle that um, we collectively face in trying to you know, continue to shift people's interest into, into developing and managing gardens that are more adapted to where we live? Ah, uh, well, that's, yeah. That's, that's an unfair question because <laughs> yes, I know you don't. You so can much, dodge it, but yeah, if you had some thoughts so on much, it, I'd love to hear what yeah, you have to say. Because um, I get so wrapped up in trying to make a you know show an alternative that I I I, I, I you know and because of that and because I meet people like you and and Steve and, and people who are active in trying to make a difference themselves, I don't see all the negative stuff as much. Um, I. I or, or hear about the problems. Uh, I, I'm looking for the solutions, and um, I, I I don't know why it's not more quickly ad adapted. Um, I think the media still has an issue with what beauty is supposed to look like. Um, we need to, you know, not just in photographs, but in media and in conversations, talk about the climate and nature as its own beauty. I um, I think one one problem is education, even at the lowest level, um, outdoor education. Um, that if kids don't understand the natural beauty of the summer dry climate in our California landscape, as they grow older, they're not gonna uh, see that as a, as a standard of beauty. They're gonna watch the, we're still dominated in, in our culture by East Coast and English style and the media and the magazines and whatnot. Um, so if you're not realizing how beautiful our native habitats are, you're gonna be highly influenced by, by other sources. So, education I think is really important um, so people understand you know that brown is beautiful I mean right now it's it's you know it's it's really because we're in a severe drought uh, it's hard to get real excited about it um, but, but in truth it is we, we have a different aesthetic we need to honor that and, and show how we who are gardeners can connect to the larger um, environment and I think that's um, it's not happening fast enough for my uh, you know, I'm getting very impatient sometimes, but I, I think we are making a difference. I think I, I also think with the, um, the the current climate crisis being recognized by most people, there's still some deniers, but still most people recognize there is climate crisis, and they want to do something. I think the message that gardeners can have is we can do a little bit, you know, and we should act as if everything we do makes a difference, um, and that's that will increasingly become a, a positive message for those who don't want to get lost in the dystopia of, of a crisis. Um, um, I, I hope that will make a difference, but I, you know, I, if, if we knew, you know, how to, to advocate better, you know, like at a civic horticulture level or, or Southern California hort level, we would be doing it. You know, we were trying to figure out how to influence um, the general public and, and how to show them a different aesthetic. And it's not just about, um, the aesthetic beauty of a, of a flower is the beauty of an ecosystem. Um, that's a beautiful thing when it's working well. And, um, and so gardeners can make that happen. And I, you know, I want to help promote that. I think that was a great answer. And I do think, yeah, well, you know, education, wrong. education is, you know, a key part of all of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I concur. Exactly. And also all of us realizing that every little bit helps of what we do and what we recommend to friends who are gardening, what to add, every little bit helps. Yeah, even on an, on an advocacy level, as I, you know, with the Green New Deal, uh, politicians need to understand what green infrastructure is 
And even if you're not a gardener and you see like the whole, I mentioned the, my presentation about bioswales, that's, you know, people think about green infrastructure, they are thinking about solar in the grid, but the green infrastructure is much bigger than that. It's, it's literally the green infrastructure. And so those kinds of things, even if you're not a gardener, you can advocate for, you can put your dollars behind activists or, or politicians and, and, and try to help um, sway the voters. Um, I think that's, you know, we can't just do it by examples of our own gardens because there aren't enough gardeners, quite honestly. I mean, we, you know, we, I don't know how many in this audience actually are gardeners, probably most of us, but, but in a given population of a big city, most people are not gardeners. And so they, those people who are not gardeners need to understand that uh, gardening ideas, green infrastructure is really a positive force. Uh, and that those people can try to, it's like join the Sierra Club. You may not be a hiker, but you join the Sierra Club or Audubon Society because you want to be part of a larger movement. Um, and gardening can be, a, needs to be, yeah, I don't want to make it politicize it, but it's it. You know, we need to have influence beyond just the people who actually are gardeners. Exactly, and actually, Saxon. On that note, I'm going to take a minor break because we are at eight. We are past eight thirty. Um, I do want to do our door prize, which is a copy of your new book. So I'm going to share my screen. And we have our wheel of names. So let's give her a, <laughs> let's give her a go. <clears throat> Daniel S. Daniel S. Are you with us right now? Let's see. I don't see Daniel there. Okay, we're gonna give it another go. Nancy N. Nancy, are you here? Let's see. Oh, Nancy, you're not here either. Okay. This is so exciting. Who are all these people that left the meeting? I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you leave early. You miss out on prizes. Carol R. Carol, are you here? Carol, you're here! Congratulations! I will be emailing you later so that we can send you your prize. So thank you for attending and thank you everyone for attending tonight. It's been a great, we've had a great time. I've had a great time. I like to speak for, for us. Um, and make sure that you mark your calendars for next month because next month on July, on Thursday, July 8th, right here on Zoom, we will be hosting Joanna Glavinsky of the Fruit Institute, who's going to be discussing residential fruit trees, ins and outs. And Joanna is also going to be leading our first coffee in the garden uh, that we've had since the pandemic. So stay tuned for the details and how to RSVP as well. We will announce everything on our website and through our social media channels as well. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, if you have also, if you have benefited at all from our webinars tonight or any of the content that we post online too, you know, think about donating to us or even better, what we all love is becoming members because when we grow our membership base, we can really offer more to everyone. And you guys get a lot more out of your money too when you become a member. So we have memberships starting as low as $10. So make sure to visit SoCalHort.com slash join to become a member. Or if you want to donate, any amount is we're gracious for, go to SoCalHort.org slash donate. And you can always just visit our website, SoCalHort.org to get all that information. So thank you for everyone who has attended tonight. And we will continue because we do have a few more questions. And again, if anyone on Facebook has a question too, you can always write those in the comments. I will be moderating that as well. And yes, we have, we are recording this webinar. So again, stay tuned for the alerts that we have it up on our website. It should be there uh, by this weekend. And I think those are all, we have a couple of questions. All right, so for our first question, we have uh, from Yvonne, what was the problem with the 
Echium being invasive. My several cultivars have never scattered seed. Ah, well, Echium is a big, big genus. There are certainly Echiums. That, um, Echium fasciosum is the one the, called Prada Madeira that's so invasive, um, at least up here in Northern California. Um, I've seen it myself. I've seen it dominating some of the landscapes uh, in the coastal areas. Um, it, it's not so invasive inland where it's, where it's hotter. Um, and that's true of a lot of plants. I know in Southern California, uh, uh, some penicetums are really invasive there that are not invasive elsewhere. It's, it's a local problem oftentimes. Um, so I'm not sure which uh, cultivars uh, Vaughn may be having, but they are, you know, it's a, it's a big genus and there are lots of them that are, that are, are well behaved. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's a, you make a good point, Saxon, because invasive plants, just like climate appropriate plants, it really, um, place is critically important. Something that's invasive in one region may not be problematic at all someplace else. I will say that Echiums were initially planted. Echium fastuosum was initially planted at the nature gardens and I removed them because they were starting to seed around. And I know that in the Santa Barbara area, they were starting to um, um, pop up in, in the Coast Live Oak woodland, you know, the, the sunny borders of the Coast Live Oak um, natural vegetation. And so they have made their way down into Central and Southern California um, naturalizing, but, you know, in super hot, super dry areas, maybe less so. Carol? Yes. Um, uh, mine actually, I had one in my backyard from an old, old planting. It died many years ago. Uh -huh. And two years ago, when we had some decent rain, yep. I had five seedlings pop up after mm -hmm. many years of not being there. So yes, they can. It's yeah. not necessarily invasive, but yeah, it can seed around. Right. So I think it's one to just be careful about, you know, in, in our region. Um, no, because a, sometimes it just takes a while for, for plants that have been in cultivation for a long time to, to kind of hit that tipping point where they start to naturalize. And it's not always easy to predict which plants might exhibit that behavior. And you know, also, as I say, Echium is, is a big class of plants. You know, Echium plantaginaeum, I think it is, one called Blue Better, is like a small perennial uh, in, in a garden. So it's um, right. right. They're just there at once, you know, so it depends on which ones you're dealing with. Correct. Yep. All right, thank you. The next one is from Lynn. Can you speak to summer dry shade gardens? Many of us have relatively small lots shaded by neighboring buildings. Finding plant materials that can deal with these conditions can be challenging. Oh, I, um, that's why you need the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or resources, because I, um, I mean, deep shade, of course, is a real problem. If you're right close to the north side of a house, uh, is, is deep shade. Um, but I live in an oak forest. Um, well, not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's Oak Bay Madrone Forest. It's open. The, the, the oak trees are old uh, and highly limbed up. So there's a high shade here. Um, and I have great, I don't, I call them shade plants. Some of my favorite California native sh deciduous shrubs, um, uh, Styrax, uh, uh, Ribes, uh, Philadelphus, do great in the sh they're, they're shade plants. They, they do fine. They, part of the problem of houses in the shade is the soil is really compacted uh, from years of people walking around the house. Um, so the soils need to be loosened up um, with, um, uh, or not turned over, but just, adding organic matter. I, I mulch a lot as to me, as that's the secret of having a, a, a low water use garden is mulching a lot. Um, what we're learning with the uh, roots in the rhizosphere is that the roots talk to each other. They share resources. Um, when they're healthy, um, they, they can thrive. And that often means root competition and it can mean competition under trees. A lot of trees have big roots and they, they, they suck nutrients and water themselves. So um, I think there are lots of plants that do fine in, in the shade. Um, you just have to figure out which ones and, and, and go find some demonstration gardens. I, 
uh, there's a hookra rosada, which is great. I love hookras. They're, they're shade adapted, rarely drop tolerant, um, dry, gly, primate, gly, <laughs> dry climate adapted. Um, I'm sure uh, Carol has some good ideas too. I think shade is in a way, it's, it's a benefit. You're not in the open sun. The open sun is harder to me than, than shade. Well, I think you, you hit on a couple of key points. You know, what, what kind of shade is it? Is it full shade? Is it dappled shade? Is it the shade from a tree or the shade from a building? And so, you know, assessing what your, you know, what your immediate conditions are is sort of the first step. Um, and then the soil. Of, of course is critical um, to determine what kind of soil you have and what plants will be, um, you can grow in that soil. I'll put in a plug from the book that Bart and Dave and I did. We have a, um, on California native plants, we have um, a couple of lists that we put together in that book of plants that will grow in dry shade. Um, and so there's, I think we have at least 30 or 40 native plants that we listed just in, in that one list alone. So. And of course, it depends on what climate zone you're in. You mentioned heucheras, and they're not as um, summer dry tolerant down here in Southern California as they are for you. Um, I think most of the our native heucheras need some summer water to be happy, um, with the exception of heuchera maxima, you know, the island alum root. That one can get by with little, very little water in the summertime. The, some of those more colorful cultivars um, need some more. I mean, they don't, they're not guzzlers by any means, but they do need some to make it through our very long dry summers down here. Do you have rosada? Yes, no? yes, the... we planted, um, I, I planted quite a bit of that at the nature gardens and uh, Wendy, we have two really nice um, yep. beds of those and those do get watered, um, I think the, my memory is right. We watered those beds like a couple times a month during the summertime. Yeah. Well, so that's, it's not no water. Yeah, no, I, that's a presentation. I, I think we have to have some water for gardens. We have to right. learn which plants can thrive on low water, but right. not no water. Uh, I don't think that's, you know, that's really hard. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I those, see, those beds were also, you know, at least one of them, the rosada was underneath a pretty sizable trees. So there was a lot of root competition and they were doing okay. I think we do have two more questions. So the next one is from Kelly. How do I incorporate a veggie garden into a summer dry garden? Oh, well, well you know, veggie gardens are their own thing. They, they require constant water, you know, um, or, or to keep things going so that they really are not part of a, the summer dry concept is a climate uh, concept and, and vegetable gardens are independent of that. They're, they're their own little ecosystems. You know, they're not, they're not climate adapted. They're, they're edible. And so they, they really require water. So I, um, you know, they're, that's their own, you know, it's whether you live in a desert or in a tropical area, you know, the, uh, a, a vegetable garden is its own animal. I think you would just want to create a, a distinct space in your garden for you know uh, ve vegetables and, and not try to necessarily incorporate them into the more ornamental part of the garden. It can be done, but you know you're going to have to have plants that need regular water um, if you want to mix them with your your vegetables. I mean, there are some fruit trees that are from Mediterranean, you know, summer dry regions um, that you can get by with very low water. But most of the annual vegetable crops, you know, they, like you said, they, they're going to need fairly consistent water to provide the food that you want. I want to thank you guys. And the last one is actually not a question, but a comment from Anne. I live in the Sierra Nevadas, moved here from Ventura a few years ago. I have a much deeper connection to the water situation here. The snowpack is virtually gone and the reservoirs are so low. Your message is so important. I look forward to your book to learn more about firescaping. Oh, so well. thank you, Saxon. And thank you everyone who has attended tonight as well. And for all of your great questions and comments too. We'll not say, a lot that well, said this was a great presentation. The book is not about firescaping. There's, I mean, we, we, we touched very briefly, briefly on it, um, 
there are whole books and websites about firescaping. So I, I hope you buy the book for the plant selection, but there's some really important work happening, you know, um, about firescaping. Uh, um, Pacific Horticulture has some resources. There's uh, um, a lot of the uh, master gardeners in the state have some really good websites about firescaping. Um, and the book will have some reference to plants that might be adapted, but uh, uh, if your concern is firescaping, um, uh, that, that, <laughs> that our book is not the answer for that. So, <laughs> so thank you though for the comments. I think it is important we understand we need tools to, to deal with this water shortage. Thank you everyone. Again, we will have this recording up on our website and our YouTube channel uh, later this weekend. And make sure to join us next month with Joanna Glavinsky as well. Saxon, thank you so much for your time tonight. Oh, thank oh. you for this awesome presentation as well. Me. Of course. So. And thank you everyone. I wish you all a great weekend and I hope you all stay cool too. Bye-bye. Thank you, Saxon. It was Thanks, great. Sarah. See you.